ladies. Hey, congratulations for Sensor. Uh, hi, Gabe. Thank you. Hey, terrific. Yeah, I I've saw I I've first saw this film at the Sundance Film Festival, and I thought it it was it was great. So it was it was even better watching it the second time around. <laughs> uh, thank you. So, uh, Prano, let, let's start with you. Where, where did the original idea came from for Censor? Um, so the original idea, I mean, I suppose the kind of first spark of the idea was when I was, a, it was a long time ago, I was reading this article on the Hammer Horror era, which is obviously earlier than, than when the film is set. But there was a note about the way censors would view these films. And it, it said that they'd always cut the image of blood on the breast of a woman because they believed that blood on the breast, uh, the image of blood on a breast would make men likely to commit rape. And I thought, well, surely there were lots of male film censors sitting in those rooms. And if these images are supposed to make us do these terrible things, what's protecting the film censor from losing control? Um, and I started to think about the idea of a film censor who started to believe that maybe they were deep down a bad person and maybe these images could do something terrible to them. And that was kind of the beginning. So I started to read about censorship through the ages um, in the UK and quickly landed in the video nasty era because over here there was a, a, a lot of moral panic around the boom in low budget horror that became available when VHS happened. Um, now these films could go direct to the home. And so it seemed to me like the perfect time to kind of explore our relationship with horror and society's relationship with horror and this conversation around, you know, it's a, it's a conversation between fiction and reality and, and a conversation around, you know, whether these images um, affect us in some way, I suppose. Absolutely. Neve, you, it was a great performance uh, throughout the, from beginning to end. Uh, why did you want to do something um, like this? story was the character in the story I was I was just really drawn in by it um it was unlike anything I'd ever played before and just the, just playing around with the idea of psychological distortion and repressed memory is is something that really fascinated me and I, like for me so much of the joy that I find in acting is the research involved and like I didn't really understand what a film censor was until I <laughs> started started this project and uh, Prano, just the working relationship with her, she's been so incredibly collaborative and sent me this whole watch list of movies from the idea of watching a few, or for quite a lot actually, uh, video nasties and then just tonally what it is that she was trying to explore within the character of Enid and I suppose it's just the idea of where the character starts and where she finishes is just this extreme 180 and for any actor just reading that in a script it, it, it's just really exciting because you can there's so many ways that you could go with it and I don't know I just always love characters that are quite broken and misunderstood so for me this was just going to be an absolute joy. Wow so there was a lot of research uh, done uh, for for a film like this and, and now, now I'm curious um, Prano and the um what was on that list of movies that uh, that was to be watched? So this way, us fans could watch it to uh, follow along. <laughs> I mean, there were a few films I was sending Neve. There was, um, I think I sent you Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Let's Scare Jessica to Death, um, Cannibal Holocaust. I was, I was trying to, I mean, there were different films I was sending Neve for different reasons. So for looking at Enid, um, specifically, Let's Get Jessica to Death, The Piano Teacher, and I think Christine, Black Swan, these films of, of women unraveling, but um, also The Piano Teacher, I found a really interesting um, sort of reference point because she's so uptight and done up in that film. And um, there was an element of Enid in there. Um, but then in terms of like bringing Neve into the headspace of a censor during this period I wanted her to watch some of the nasties so you know I was sending her um I, I, I remember specifically making Neve and Nick Burns who plays Sanderson watch the um 
the turtle killing scene in uh, Cannibal Holocaust during our rehearsals because I wanted them to engage with this idea that it wasn't all, you know, sausages for intestines and, you know, old fashioned, what we see now as old fashioned effects, but that actually these sensors were sitting there not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing what to expect, you know, and whether it could be real or not, you know, you have something, um, yeah, like faces of death or something like that, that, that obviously has real footage. So it was a mixture, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I'll pass over to Neve. <laughs> Yeah, along with that, and then there was also just a, so much reading material on um, psychological trauma with, with small children and um, the idea of, uh, it was because of this talk about this amnesiac killer and the idea that could you have done something so bad that you forget it? And there was a few um, theses on it, well, short theses, like, you know, uh, articles and yeah, there was just an abundance of, I remember just every weekend, Pana would just send me emails and just drop boxes of uh, movies and articles and images. And when we went in, it was so cool. It was just that each department had just storyboards and the, the storyboards and mood boards and director's notes were just plastered everywhere in each department. And it was just such a lovely feeling to be reminded of just tonally and visually of what we as a, a team were trying to achieve. Yeah, I, I, I remember some of those movies and especially Faces of Death gives me nightmares when I was a teen. That, that, that's for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I guess the uh, irony is the character, um, you know, because she watches um, all, all these movies and she starts to blur, you know, reality with, with you know, with, with the, what's, what's in her head. How easy was it for you to turn it on and off, uh, you know, from getting this into your headspace? Um, turning, it, turning it on wasn't the problem, it was turning it off <laughs> and in the evening because it, like, I'd love to say that I'd love to be an actor that like, you know, go home at the end of the day and it's a job, but with something like this, it's, it's such a, it is a stretch. You, you really exercise in those, um, emotions and, and digging kind of deep into that well and um, but I was so blessed to have Prano as this director who would check in with you in the evenings and we went to for dinner I think a lot of the time after work and it, it's it's really nice to just decompress and just talk through the scenes but I was also blessed enough to have this rehearsal space just beforehand so there was all these physical ticks that the character goes through that it would also allow me to I suppose access doing it was but putting the you know you have about two hours in the morning in the hair and makeup chair where I just listen to music and I have a playlist for the character and when they're putting the wig on and putting all the costume you immediately begin to kind of sit into that character and as the character kind of progressed and has her hair down and has um I suppose like a costume she feels uncomfortable because of this idea that she's almost putting on her she is herself putting on a costume um but yeah, it's it was it was it was a challenge, but it was such an enjoyable challenge. As you brought up the costumes, because uh, I lived during the '80s and I don't even remember a lot of those costumes. So, how did it feel uh, donning those uh, costumes? And where are those glasses now? Where are those glasses now, Bruno? I was promising. I, I, I think they must be with our costume designer, Saffron. Yes. Yeah, she held yeah. on to them. <laughs> oh, I love the, I remember just Saffron just sending me mood boards of the, what the character was going to be wearing <laughs> uh, just the ideas of it and she was just like how do you feel about glasses and I just reply back going yes the bigger the better I mean <laughs> so there was a whole day of just trying on because I don't wear glasses um, in real life and I just love the idea of just having giant giant <laughs> glasses and I remember just my when my granny growing up she had like glasses like that and we, we as children used to steal them and wear them going around the house and we called her Specky, but <laughs> that was, I just love, I love the character, I love the high waist pants. Um, yeah, it was, it was like Saffron really, really nailed it. And like the color palette, it's like you have all these kind of blues and then these crushed purples as the character slowly begins to kind of break down. And, and there's the introduction of this color palette and um, Annika Summers and our DOP 
just the use of lights um just these and, and as the you know just the bold strong colors as as the character begins to kind of progress into further and further into her psyche it was, it was just beautiful to watch and see everyone bringing their their piece of the character into into each of the set pieces <laughs> excellent prano one of the things that uh, horror fans would love about this film is the cinematography. Could you talk about the cinematography and the usage of, you know, different uh, cinema graphics uh, um, for, for throughout the entire film? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, the, I worked with my, my longtime collaborator, Annika Summerson, who's the DOP. And um, very early on, you know, I made the decision that I wanted to shoot this on 35 millimeter. Um, because obviously it's set in the 80s and you're really trying to um, summon that era for people and I, I feel that film can do that for us um, but I think it was it was a lot of fun because you're getting to create the kind of real gritty 80s Britain that I remember and Neve was talking about the colours these kind of blues and greys like a lot of the time when we think about the 80s you know we think about like high shoulder pads and big earrings and things but for me it was all about this kind of like dull palette, you know, Thatcher's Britain and kind of grey, bleak, British life. But then, you know, through the cinematography, we're moving into um, the lurid, uh, colourful world of the video nasties. So I got to like reference some of the directors from that period in some of the films that you see within the film. So, you know, th they were kind of part inspired by things like a lot of Lucio Fulci films and Argento films that I was kind of leaning into for, for some of the films within the film. Um, and then, yeah, we kind of moved through into the video nasty world. And for me, the kind of aspect ratio shift um, is part representative of this shift into a sort of fictional world, but also obviously a nod to the era. So it was a lot of fun just breaking down what tools we had, I guess, based on um, the styles and techniques of the period and how we could employ those things to tell our story, you know, and what's useful to our story and what, what isn't, you know, nothing's there just for the sake of it. It's all there for, for the experience, but it was fun to be able to kind of reference those things and also have those little winks and nods for the people who appreciate them in the audience. That is most excellent. And Eva, one, one, one last question here, because uh, you, you work with, uh, you know, practical blood on this set and, uh, and CGI blood before. Um, what are the, how, how are the experiences different be between the two for you? Sticky. <laughs> <laughs> practical blood is so sticky because it's, um, it's mi mixed with like uh, glucose and sugar water. So, um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, you kind of forget as well. I remember it's like near the end where the character is, where she ends kind of at the end and she's, she's covered in blood. I remember I was, well, I was like, I said to the driver, I was like, can I just jump out really quickly? I just want to jump into the shop. And I had like, keep warm on over my, over my dress. <laughs> like you forget it's there. I walked into the shop and I was just like getting a can of coke and the, like you know the shopkeeper just looking at you like you are a maniac and you're like thank you walking out um but yeah it's a uh, the, the, just the continuity and the makeup team on it Ruth our, our makeup artist she's I remember it was just like it's, she was an artist every every morning trying to recreate those lines and then you go home at the end of the day when you forget to like wash it slightly out your hairline um, yeah, it's a sticky, it's a sticky, uh, sticky encounter. At most, excellent. Well, hey, thank you, ladies, for our speaking um, with us about uh, Sensor. It's quite a enjoyable film. It's uh, highly recommended to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick.